Thank you for joining us for See What Your Customers See, Mapping Your Real Customer Experience. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items so that we can let you know how you can participate in today's web event. Uh, Kalina, if you'll go ahead and advance to the next slide. We're looking at the, an example of the GoToWebinar interface, which is made up of two, far, two parts. Um, over on the left-hand side is the viewer window, and this is where you can see the presentation. Um, from the presenter, and by clicking on the lower right-hand corner of that section of your screen, you can resize it to be the size that you need it to be. Over on the right-hand side is the control panel, and this is how you can interact with us. Throughout the presentation, as questions occur to you, please be sure to type them into the questions box and hit submit or send, and we will respond to questions. Um, for those of you who may be having any kind of technical issues, please use that to communicate with me and I'll um, address your issues. Um, and then at the end of the presentation, for, for the time that we have available for questions and answers, we will address as many questions as time allows. For those questions that we don't get to, we will be um, in contact with you after the webinar concludes. I'll tell you a little bit about Beyond Philosophy, Clint, if you'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Customer experience is all we do at Beyond Philosophy. Since 2002, we've really pushed the envelope on thought leadership, and we've written four books. The, the fourth one just released last fall. We have offices in London and Atlanta and partners throughout Europe and Asia. Lots of strong links with academia, and we, our particular focus is on the emotional side of customer experience, because as you all are probably aware, at least 50% of every transaction occurs on a subconscious or emotional level. The next slide shows you a little bit about um, some of the companies that we've worked with over the years. And as you can see, they're from all around the world. We have two really talented speakers with us today. Um, Stephen Walden has a master's degree in strategic marketing focus on segmentation methodologies, and he's our senior head of research and consulting at Beyond Philosophy. He's got strong um, links to leading business schools and 14 years of consulting expertise. And Stephen is a recognized expert in how to use emotions and subconscious minds of clients and customers to generate value in the experience, um, really the, the crux of um, Beyond Philosophy's background. Kalina is a consultant with Beyond Philosophy, and she's also a business psychologist. Her customer exper expertise is on identifying and analyzing the emotional and subconscious aspects, aspects of the customer business interaction as well as applying quantifiable research to demonstrate the link between emotions and customer behavior. And prior to that, she worked with the um, government of Republic of Macedonia, where she was involved in managing and overseeing public administration reform. Um, the strategy that she was particularly working on was focused on the aspects of government and citizen interaction, so very much in keeping with the work that she does here at Beyond Philosophy. Today, Stephen and Kalina will share with us some insights on customer experience that should inspire and get you thinking about ways you can enhance your own organization's customer experience. And with that, I'll turn it over to Stephen. Thanks, Tammy. Um, what are we going to learn today? Well, we're learning about using emotion, how we can use that in your journey maps, touch points maps, those kind of customer journey uh, designs you use in your organization and that are regularly used. Frequently, they take a functional view rather than emotional view. We'll be showing you how to use emotion. The learning objectives will be uh, understanding for you why customers' perceptions probably are not accurate, how to identify relationships between ex key experiences and your customer touch points, and why traditional techniques don't link them effectively, what impact the visual and sensory experiences have on the customer experience, and how to create easy, valuable maps that don't require expensive software solutions. Just uh, to tee up uh, the, uh, the presentation, Beyond Philosophy are conducting and uh, recently finished a global survey on customer experience where we asked the question, how would you define customer experience? Uh, interestingly, 64% of global leaders from around the world, from uh, uh, New Zealand to Peru, stated that it was all about touch point mapping. And interestingly, a number of those, particularly more leading edge organizations, spoke about emotion and touch point mapping. So it is the standard approach, the standard definition of customer experience, which is why it's so important. It's in the mindset of organizations when they do customer experience that this is the starting point. What is the customer journey? Where are the moments of truth? 
just to give you some quotes to demonstrate this is global, uh, we have one expert who spoke about cu customer experience being everything that touches the customer matters, everything that enables the improvement towards what the customer perceives. Down to in uh, Indonesia, we had uh, an expert talk about it means customer journey mapping from end to end. So it's truly a global perspective. Customer experience is touch point mapping. We're going to give you an example of that. Uh, this is an example from Starbucks, and it shows the traditional way in which touch point maps are organized. They start off, as you can see, highlighted in the red in the middle of the, 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 the slide here, the usual starting point. What are the key journey steps the customer goes through? Here we can see that in the coffee Starbucks experience, it's office, car, walk-in, and so on and so forth. Very easy, basic steps that most journey maps start with. They then engage in looking at the experience, and you can see this in the dots on above that. A little bit small, but basically what they say are these demonstrate observable and rational things. So if you were sitting in a coffee bar doing a journey map, what you would say is, I see uh, this person standing around. I see them getting a cup of coffee. I smell the aroma. It's this kind of objective, observable, rational criteria that traditional touch point mapping, journey mapping uses. The issue with that, of course, is how do you prioritize? What is most important to the customer? In the grand scheme of things, you can get hundreds, thousands of these touch points. Where do you stop? What is most important? That it's almost like we're observing objectively, but we're not understanding what the customer themselves sees, what's important to them. It's almost like we're dealing, at the end of the day, when we take that objective, rational view, we come up with so many touch points, it's almost like the theory of everything. You have hundreds of things that you can observe in an environment, and you measure all those things, do you control all these things, where do you focus your lens, where do you put and allocate your resources to gain value to you as a business. Typically, companies have managed this process by basically taking the view, well, whatever's easiest to fix from all these touch points, whatever's cheapest or quickest, we'll do it. Or whatever we believe as an internal culture in our organization, we will focus on those few touch points and add value, do something about them. Or oftentimes, whatever is easiest to measure. Frequently, this approach, this objective approach to touch point mapping is teeing up software implementations or teeing up measurement processes for you to think about customer satisfaction or where some of you companies may apply uh, net promoter recommendation scores. The other way of looking at it is whatever gets the most complaints, companies typically think about uh, the negative side of their experience. What are the destroyers in our experience? Where can we fix a breakage. Whoever shouts the loudest in the organization will get the money to fix their specific touch points. That's how prioritization is done and it starts from the rationale of objective viewing, not putting yourself in the mindset of the company, company just taking where are, what are the touch points straight, rationally and in through observation. I'm now going to hand over Colleen, to Kalina. Thank you, Stephen. So what is different about emotional experience touch point mapping? Just so we can demonstrate the key difference, I'm going to ask you to look at the image on the left hand side. If we ask you what you see on the left hand side, probably 100% of you are going to say it's a triangle. And the answer is correct. What you see, what you perceive is a triangle because the human mind is designed such that it perceives holistic images, it tries to give meaning to what it, um, it perceives. However, objectively, what is on that image are just three lines, three separate lines. And this is the key difference between the traditional touch point mapping and the emotional experience touch point mapping. Traditional touch point mapping is going to identify the three lines as separate as they are objectively. However, experience touch point mapping is going to see the world or see the image is perceived from, by the customer. It's going to identify the meaning the image has for, for the customer. Now, if we look at the image on the right-hand side, 
um, it's a famous illusion. Half of you will probably notice the uh, beautiful girl, um, or the face of a beautiful girl. This is her nose, her eyes, her lips, and the hair. But uh, another half of you will notice a silhouette of a man uh, playing on a saxophone. Um, this is what customer experience is like. And often, companies believe that their customers perceive a, an image of a beautiful lady while at the same time in reality what customers really see is a silhouette of a man. So the challenge for every company if you are to understand the customer experience and more importantly be able to manage it the right way you will need to be able to see what your customers see and perceive. Let's take a little bit of a practical example to that point. Uh, so here we have uh, an American football game. And here we have two customers watching that American football game. The key point here is they will extract meaning from that football game dependent on what, they, what their goals are, what their view of it is. So the guy, for instance, may say, wow, this is a good game. These guys are playing rough. But don't go to the commercials yet. Whereas the woman may be observing it and saying, this game is boring, when's it going to end, when is the commercial break, or vice versa. The point here is what they observe and what they seek out of the experience is what they will see, and that will derive the touch points you should focus on. So it's not an infinite selection, it's a selection based on what is important to the customer and customers. So, you can hopefully see from that that what is important is what is emotionally driving. So I, uh, the, the fact that I'm looking at the game because I like it, that has an emotional impact. The fact that I find it boring, that has an emotional impact. So what you see is derived from what is meaningful to you, which is basically what is emotional. There's a number of academics, which we're showing in this slide, that support this emotional viewpoint. So for instance, um, the key point here is that what is emotional drives behavior. Emotion leads to action, while reason leads to conclusions, says Kane. Emotions are prime candidates for turning a thinking being into an actor, and that means a doer. That's from Frigida and Manstead. Customers are always emotional, from Barlow and Moll. And emotion and reason are intertwined, but when they are in conflict, emotion wins every time. That's from the Market Research SMR conference in 2002. And while many, um, in fact, many companies recognize this fact, and I, I hope or we hope that it's not news for you that the experience has two aspects, or the customer experience has two aspects of it, a rational or cognitive uh, aspect and an emotional aspect. Um, the, the difficult part is a lot of companies find it easy, easy to recognize the rational or cognitive aspect and, and act upon it. But what is difficult for them is to assess or, um, and access the emotional experience. Uh, but just so we can demonstrate the importance of this, um, take, given that the experience has these two sides, the outcome from an interaction between a business and a customer can, have, uh, can be either positive or negative, or uh, good or bad. So let's just see what happens when, um, when we come across these different four combinations of positive and negative outcome from the cognitive and emotional um, sides of the experience. Well, when a customer walks out of an interaction feeling good about what they uh, received cognitively and rationally and uh, feeling, uh, feeling good, just feeling good, then their conclusion is that that company is actually best that they could have had. They're satisfied, they're willing to recommend, and they're willing to repeat the purchase. It's like walking into your favorite cafe. Um, you get the coffee that you believe tastes well, so that's your rational outcome for the price that you like, um, but you also feel good about the whole experience. You're smiling and, you're, and you feel pleasure. Um, an opposite example of that is when both sides produce a negative outcome. So you didn't get the taste, the coffee did not taste the way you wanted it to. Um, you also, one of the staff was rude, so now you're feeling dissatisfied and or offended. Your general, your customer conclusion will be that this was a mistake. 
so very unlikely to repeat that behavior, to go back to that coffee shop, very unlikely to recommend, or even worse, likely to speak negatively about the experience. The interesting part, however, is when we look at what happens when rationally you're satisfied, um, however you feel bad emotionally about it. Um, so let's just imagine that you were, um, you were forced to go to a coffee shop that you didn't like um, for a business meeting. This is a very important client and you know that for the, this is your client's favorite coffee shop. So rationally, it is the right thing to take your client over there. But you're not going to feel good about the experience because um, traditionally you haven't felt uh, well. What customers conclude in this instance is that this was a forced decision, forced choice. They wouldn't necessarily repeat it unless something very extraordinary happens on this occasion and delights them so much that actually intrigues them to go back. Which is not the case when um, co the cognitive outcome is negative but the emotional is positive. So let's just imagine you go to your coffee shop and while you didn't get the coffee you expected, somehow either the ambience or the treatment that you got from the staff uh, made you feel positive about it. Um, as a customer, you might conclude that this could have been a one-off, so maybe it will be better uh, next time, and you're willing to give them a chance just because emotionally you felt that satisfaction. Why is this important from a business perspective? Well, because positive emotional outcome helps you build loyalty while negative emotional outcome creates a lot of risk. And just as I said before, and Stephen emphasized, it's very easy for companies to measure, to assess, or to investigate the cognitive outcome, the observable, the objective, the physical. But it's very difficult for them systematically to access and, um, and investigate the emotional side of the experience. Um, Given that touch point mapping is a traditional method of managing the customer experience, or um, we are going to show you today how you can touch point uh, map out your customer experience, bearing in mind both sides of the customer experience. Thanks, Kalina. Okay, so essentially what we're going to do is we're going to put the C in CEM, the customer in customer experience management, by looking at how they see the world through the lens of emotion. Remember that picture of the two people watching the American football game? What they saw was what drove their emotions, and their emotions drive behavior, which drives value to you as a business. So if you're not thinking about emotions and not looking through that lens in touch point mapping, then you're kind of missing the point. But of course, to do that, we need, and to put the C in CEM, we need a framework to operate uh, the customer's mindset. In other words, we need a theory. So I'm going to start with a theory, a framework you can use to operationalize understanding how customers feel. This looks, this is a, basically there's a, a four sets to looking at emotions and two key dimensions. Those dimensions are emotions derived from the self, the person in the coffee shop, and the, person, the emotions derived from the experience, the other. Okay, so let me just walk this through. The self, emotions derived from the goals that you seek. These can be major goals, like I want uh, to get a, uh, a certain flavors of coffee at a certain price. Have those goals been achieved or not? That derives an emotion. Uh, also, there are sub-goals. These are sort of tactical goals. As I walk through this experience in the coffee shop, can I get to my seat easily enough? Is the staff member friendly or unfriendly? And there's also a level of how you are feeling as you go through. Are you happy? Are you sad? It's a standard one, but there's also are the stress level. Are you coping or are you not coping? That kind of like hits the hot buttons if you're not coping and you're unha unhappy. If, for instance, you are coping and you're unhappy, that's a different scenario. And the other third part of how emotions derived within the self is memory. So this is sort of what Baumeister calls 
uh, the affective residue. What does this mean? It's basically your emotional response from previous experiences or your prejudice or your expectations. Those give impressions that you drag out from yourself to, to help in defining an emotional reaction to an environment. So in the coffee shop, uh, I went to a coffee shop last week that was dirty and the service was poor. I will remember that when I go back to that coffee shop in a month's time. That's the emotional, or in other words, affective residue that comes to bear. However, there's another part of emotions, and that is from the other. We call from the ambience, if you like, from the mood of the experience. Classic example of that would be if you go into a grocery store, the way they play music or light music, uh, the smells from the bakery in the grocery store. These are all things you do that impact on your customers, either in a B2B or B2C environment, that will have an emotional effect. So they're derived from the self and from the other. We're going to apply that framework in the work that we do to map emotions. What does this do? If we go back to our original point, the theory of everything, how does this help? Well, if you look at the emotion drivers, if you like, our goals from that previous theory and sub-goals, you can derive uh, what customers want and also derive their fears, what they don't want. And this is the lens you apply, and we derive this through walk the experience or projective techniques. It's the lens we apply to say what are the limited selection of touch points people will view because it hits on what they Want. So, simple example, I want to enter this room. So, ease of entry is going to be important. I want to find a seat. So, the availability of chairs is going to be important. I don't want to sit in the sun. So, the positioning is going to be important. Likewise, there's the ambience effect. It's going to deliver a limited selection of touch points that are important and meaningful to me, such as the feel of the floor delivering comfort, the light in the room making it feel nice and awakening. So, by having that framework, by understanding what is meaningful to the customer and therefore emotional, you do not need to apply the theory of everything. You need to gain the theory of something, something meaningful, which delivers that limited selection you can focus on. In other words, an experience is not just a summation of touch points, but how the customer extracts value from those touch points by being meaningful to them. In other words, some touch points will weigh heavier than others. You do not need to follow an ex theory of everything approach. There's another interesting thing to this, which is often missed in traditional touch points, that's mapping. That's not just the fact that you can look emotionally at how your customer or customer groups behave, but also you can see, well, you take a value chain approach. I walk into the coffee shop, what's the, if you like, the emotional reaction of the firm towards me? What are their goals to maximize revenue? What are their sub-goals to close at five o'clock? What's their memory? Customers are a pain, for instance. What's the ambience? It's these kind of things. The firm itself has an emotive reaction towards the customer. And you can also, likewise, you can get a little bit as complicated as you like with this value chain approach, but you can see how some customer groups influence other customers' groups. The point of life is this. You have a framework by following this emotional model and you can apply a value chain approach to see how people interrelate and see what is important and also see the experience gap between what you as a company seek emotionally to maximize revenue and what the customer seeks emotionally to get comfort and uh, on uh, a variety of drinks or whatever that might be. Now that's giving you an outline, so in brief summary again, we're trying to get into the customer psychology in their mindset. How do we do that? We look through the emotional lens, because the most through the emotions that we understand what they see, because customers don't follow an objective rational approach, they see what they want to see, what hits their goals, what is meaningful to them. Now, that's all very well. So we have a large number of um, viewpoints, perspectives, as you can see in the top of the funnel, um, that goes in. You have maybe quite a few touch points there. It's not the theory of everything. It's the theory of something. But still, you can't manage everything there. You still have to prioritize. So what we do is we take this approach. We take all the views 
from the, all the touch points that are meaningful, and we feed them through a mathematical process to come up with the key things that drive or destroy value. And we will explain that, because that moving from the subjective to the objective is quite important. Traditional touch points maps fail to include that approach to define objectively the drivers and destroyers empirically the drivers and destroyers of value to your organization. That's quite a significant difference, again, from traditional mapping. So, how do you do it? You understand the framework. You understand the importance. You understand the principles. So what practically could we do? What should we do? We're going to give you a little basic example from online application in the insurance industry. First of all, we go through an ethnographic phrase. Uh, we spoke about needing to put yourself in the shoes of the customer, needing to understand what goals, sub-goals, memory, the ambience of the experience. That requires an expert walkthrough or expert observation process. Typically, we use our own experts to do this. We use our own observation forms that, again, talk about the psychology of the experience as they walk through. We use multimedia. Sometimes we use photographs, video, audio. You get to the heart of what the experience emotionally means to customers. Also, likewise, you could use projectors with your own customer groups, clearly. Then we set up the framework. And the framework is, at this point, half traditional. If you remember from the Starbucks example, we had that center framework of the simple steps customers go through. This is kind of like a little bit similar, except what we're uh, interested here is not just the physical steps, in this case with online application, not just I logged on, I searched on Google, I checked comparison websites, but also the psychological steps. For instance, my level of awareness prior to going into this event, how I make a decision about whether to browse on your site or not. And this is quite an important point. We did this work with a large, um, from, um, a large FMCG-based organization and what they did, they understood, um, they had some outsourced uh, catering, uh, and what they found out was you could sit there and you could observe people in a catering environment just standing there. And you could say, people in the catering environment. That could be the physical step. But that's not what is actually happening. This is a, a psychological mindset tool. What we're interested in, what goes on in the mind of the customer psychologically. Decisioning is going on in the mind. They're not just standing there, they're browsing and they're deciding. Decisioning is a psychological step and it is a key step. They may be standing there but they are doing something that you can't necessarily observe but is psychologically important which sets the framework by knowing that for an intervention such as your staff going to ask questions about how they can help and so on and so forth. So it's a very practical way of managing things and opens up opportunities for you to intervene to help customers and clients emotionally. That's our initial framework. So far, half traditional, I would say. We then set up the process, and again, what we tend to use is a, a simple way of mapping this on a large brown paper wall, what we call the experience or emotional experience wall. So we set this up, set up the columns from the uh, steps that we've designed. We then start, if you remember, emotions in the self relate to what you seek from the experience, your goals. And you have top-level goals. If you remember, we spoke about I going to the coffee shop. What do I want initially? What's my trigger goal? Well, I want the coffee to be at a certain price with a variety of flavors, for instance. This sits at the top level. These top-level goals tee up emotions. They're important to map. Critically, you can see, as a basic example, value chain approach, the company likewise has what we would call emotional goals to maximize revenue, to avoid high-risk customers, to be recognized. Okay, So that's the, the first stage. The, the customer goals, these strategic goals are important because they're actually your customer's vision and your company's vision. And there are a lot of ways that you can achieve this vision, but as and some of them are going to collide. We're taking into consideration the company's uh, goals as well because we are aware that companies cannot do everything that customers want or need. But as long as you have in mind as a business your customer strategic goal, you can always 
work out or find out the tactics that can get you there um, at, your, at the right price. Why are we looking at roles, goals? Just to roll back, because academically we've searched the literature, we found that that's the emotional framework. Key names, Lazarus, Claw and Ortney, about goal states, teeing up emotion, refer back all the time to that base level theory. And if you remember, another part of that base level theory was understanding sub-goals. For instance, I want or I don't want statements. I want to find uh, it quickly. I want to find a reputational company. I don't want pop-ups when I log on. All these are little goal states along the customer journey that where you derive your emotion state because I want it or I don't want it, that's what I'm going to observe. We then have the feelings line. If you remember the states which people are in themselves, whether they're coping or whether they're unhappy or happy. So there's two dimensions essentially to this. Levels of coping, which derives stress levels, and levels of valence, which is a fancy name for basically, are you happy or are you unhappy? What's key here, of course, is when you have low coping and low levels of happiness. For instance, at the main page, we can see at the very end of that uh, row, there is a level of unhappiness and a low level of coping. That can be a dangerous point. And then we get the ambience or mood music of your experience. For instance, and this is again sort of look and feel, which is why we like to use pictures or illustrations at this point to demonstrate that. Traditional mapping would not do that. It would fail to realize the feel that through the visual appeal or the tone of voice, that kind of dimension to your experience that is very important and people take value from. The look of your main page, uh, your, the look of the advertisement you saw for whatever company you're going to get your insurance from. And then we have, in, again, following this framework, the memory of the experience. Remember what we said about Baumeister's Baal, affective residue, that strange term from academia, it basically means the emotional memory of what you've experienced before or just quite frankly your prejudice from what other people have stated. These all come to bear. Their adverts are professional. Many insurance companies are online. Insurance information is complicated. So that's the kind of thing we're mapping. At the moment it's just the as is state. What is happening? What are the key touch points and what people seek and what they see? Then of course we can go to define what works, the green roots, what works well. It's as simple and straightforward as that. Looking on this large brown paper wall, this living asset of your experience, what works well. And likewise, the red roots, what works badly. Where are the things we're not doing so well on? The made page look and feel, for instance. And that's basically where you are today. Of course, we spoke a little bit about taking all these subjective views, so hopefully you can now see it as a practical and executable methodology to get that. We now need to prioritize from the tens of experiences, maybe green roots, maybe red roots, that we want to focus on as an organization. To do that, we take those touch points that customers see because they're emotional drivers, and we prioritize them because, of course, you as an organization cannot do everything. We don't want to go back to the theory of everything again. So what we do there is we need to decide quantifiably, empirically, through advanced statistics, what drives or destroys value. Now, as an organization, you don't need to worry or be concerned about the advanced statistics bits in that. But what we do is we take those touch points, red roots, green roots, or whatever you as an organization feel are important, and we feed them through what we call the emotional signature approach. That is defining what drives value and also compares that to what people desire. This is a two by two box on the right hand side. So you can have touch points, for instance, that people state consciously, yep, we want that, and also drive value. That's a fairly obvious thing, conscious, low hanging fruit, let's go for it. You can either have touch points that are not desired at all, but drive value. Advertising, we did this work with a telecommunications company, is a classic example of that. Nobody's going to say necessarily that they want lots and lots of advertising, but it's still determined as a driver of value. You can also, and those are what we call subconscious values, and typically what that would hang on 
is where we mapped the ambience. That's often a state that people wouldn't necessarily, we've mapped it, we understand it through our expert knowledge, the mood, ambience, the lighting of the room, the cleanliness of the store is important to what we seek and what you deliver, but nobody's actually going to say in the grand scheme of things, do more of it. But when we do this, sometimes we do find that that is important and you should focus. And then we find other things that are desired, people state that they want it but don't drive value. Those are interesting things. They can also be opportunities. Something that you're doing at the moment people want, but it's not executed in a way that delivers value. Just giving you that framework so you can get a sense of the fact that we apply a prioritization map on top of this. So, in summary, you define, say, the 40 touch points you want to focus on through the brown paper method by going through this emotion methodology. We take those 40 touch points, for instance, and then we do a run a survey that establishes a priority order of what drives and destroys value and what people want. So you can make a decision. This is a touch point we should focus on because it delivers most value to us, low-hanging fruit. Or you can make another decision. A lot of people say they want this touch point, but it's not driving value, so we need to do something creative about it. Then what we need to do from that process of prioritization, you can see from the picture there that we give a basic bar chart, very simple to explain, that says what five or so, typically, touch points you should focus on because they are the most valuable. Then what we need to do is we need to go to redesign, and this is a critical point. There is no point, really, in doing uh, this emotional, or really any touch point mapping, unless you're going to do something with it. It's not just a means just to measure. You need to think about how you're going to use it in generating ideas, in going to a 2B state, in redesign. You need creativity. You need to think what type of organization you're going to be, whether you're a Dell or whether you're an Apple type organization, for instance. Apple focusing on design, because that's who they are, and innovation. Dell maybe trying to be more all things to all people. You need to come up with creative concepts. So the key thing is, how do you take all this information all these living acid of this brown paper wall and all the prioritization touch points, how you turn that into something creative to change the customer story. And traditional touch point mapping will generally um, give you ideas of, of the physical steps you can change and the um, physical actions uh, because that is what they, uh, it maps out. Uh, the value of the experience touch point mapping is that because it breaks down consumer psychology on the four levels that are actually relevant for their uh, behavior and their attitudes, it actually helps you generate ideas on, um, on, on what to do moving forward. So for instance, if at a certain moment of contact you're not able to meet your customers' sub goals, but you realize or you have found out that actually the feelings are very positive or they drive value for you, you can always revert to um, in implementing ideas that are going to address the feelings only, not address the how cust the customer goes about the sub goals. So one other value or benefit from um, breaking down the experience rather than the physical journey is that you get a better understanding of all the dimensions that take play in, cust in the customer psychology and you're able to manage them more easily. Okay. So we're now going to move to the redesign, going from the as-is, what we've mapped, to the 2B. First stage, we define what we call the blue routes. Where are the hot ideas? Again, we've had red routes where things go wrong, green routes where things go right, blue routes are defined opportunities, which you can map on post that prioritization. Again, this living asset concept, brown paper wall, match your experience, we're now going to put blue roots on there, our opportunities we're going to focus on. But what we need to move to, to now, when we're talking about to do, to be experienced and redesign is something very important. We move, want to move and must move away from a linear process mindset to a creative mindset. So we need a different tool set. Not just a creative mindset, but something that can easily communicate the new and better design of experience to the organization. There is no better way than doing that than storyboarding. Storyboarding is, as you can see here, using pictures, illustrations, writing a little story about the experience. It's not trite, because what it means is you're focusing in, rather like in animation, 
where they create storyboards, move the storyboard around, create new illustrations, create new stories. You are creating your story, just as in a Hollywood animation sense. It's creating that um, impulse to redesign. It's easy to communicate. It's the best method to move to this stage. You want, basically want to open up your mindset. You now know where you're going to focus because you've done that prioritization, you define the blue roots, you understand what gives you the best value, you maybe have a prioritization, maybe top 10 touch points. But you want to now see the key point. When you change the touch point, does it change the experience? You're working through the touch points to change the customer story. It is no good just thinking of changing a touch point if it has no effect on the story. And by story, we mean how people emotionally react to you. What we do in the, uh, this phase is, first of all, we sometimes do a little setup. When our experts walk the experience in devising the brown paper wall, we also ask them two days after they walk through the experience to talk to either our illustrator or bring some pictures to say what they recall. It almost acts as a projective exercise. Our illustrator can draw what they remember that sets up a template that helps later on and also sets up key things that stick in the memory that we can add to our living asset, our brown paper wall. In this case, think criminal profiling. When people remember the scene of a crime, they sit with an FBI uh, illustrator to remember that because what they remember is what is emotional and what is emotional drives value. So we tee it up early on. We then after we prioritized, after we define the opportunities and blue routes where we want to focus in our redesign, we then open it up to the audience. We then ask to try to create the storyboard for you as an organization. And again, think film animation. Think sort of uh, Monsters, Inc. Think how they designed that animation, how they looked at every single detail around that. Here, we don't need to go so far but we do need to open up the mindset to creative possibilities. So our first stage is this. We usually have a template. We apply that in the redesign. We ask for people maybe to bring pictures. We bring an illustrator along. We create that storyboard template. We then have on top of that, um, each storyboard pane, a little paragraph or two, or maybe a little bit longer, of what the story is at each stage. So we're essentially creating a, almost like a film script of your organization. In fact, art as a tool of getting to um, um, valuable ideas um, is very useful because uh, working with illustrators and, and incorporating art in the, in the phase of generating ideas helps actually people touch on their subconscious, um, helps them bring it to the surface, um, touch on their emotions, and very often when they cannot articulate um, a concrete actionable idea, they can describe the vision of it. And once you can capture people's vision of what the experience needs to be like, you can easily translate it into um, an actionable initiative. So, this is just some little uh, shots, just to, it's just like humorous, just to make the point basically. Um, we would have a slide shot, uh, we can illustrate sort of somebody on a phone, we, you know, it's the style, is up to you. We have many different styles of how we'd animate and how we'd do the storyboard, but essentially the process is this. Think Hollywood animation, we're developing your storyboard, we're opening up the creative possibilities, we're doing a picture, and we're also writing a little story. So here, Mr. H, a professional lawyer, is really excited to be going by ferry to see his brother's family. He's going to book company X as they blah blah and so on and so forth. You can get the point, it's telling a story. When we inject the touch point redesign, we inject those ideas you've decided to focus on in the story, we can see, does it change the emotional experience? If it doesn't, there's no point in doing it. Can you talk about it? Can you explain it? Can you change the visual by doing it? Can you create and move around that storyboard to create a new story of your organization that has emotional appeal and drives value for you as an organization? Here's just a little screenshot of another example of different styles of approaching this. And this is just to say we can also use the illustrated methodology to think about call centers. It doesn't have to be all visual. It can be B2B. It can look uh, deeply at phone numbers. It can look at all these style of activities. It's not restrictive. 
Okay, so. Um, a final, um, not a minor uh, point, um, is that once you have understood the customer experience, you've prioritized the touch points that you need to focus on, you have identified the ideas that you need to generate, and more importantly, you've created the storyboard that actually ca captures the vision of what the customer experience needs to be like, because Excel sheets um, and uh, financial reports cannot do that. Um, any company would move on into implementation. We're not going to um, spend much time on this point, but we will say that what is important is that you actually keep it alive. So once you have that, it, it's actually a way of you to uh, nurture a culture of customer experience centricity, if I may say so. And the final key point really is, okay, this has all been very, hopefully very practical. You've got a framework, you've decided what you want to do, you've defined the ideas, you've written the story. But the story itself is important. By having a storyboard, you can easily communicate that. And the work we've done with another company, we turn that into an animation. Communication is key. It inspires, it enthuses, it creates a culture of customer experience within your organization. It creates a culture through communicating visuals, through communicating a story about what it is, emotions. What are emotions? What do they mean? What's the redesign we're looking for? So it's also storyboarding is not just about opening up your creative brain, but it's all in helping in redesign because a story is the cheapest form of pilot. It's also about effective communication. And there's no more effective way than telling a story. So that's basically us uh, completed. So let's thank Kalina for her time. And um, Tammy, if you'd like to close, and we still have a little bit of time to answer a few questions that you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen and Kalina. I think everybody really enjoyed that presentation. Um, we do have a few questions. One of them, just to, to recap, um, what would you say is the key difference between traditional mapping and what we've talked about today? Okay, well, there's several points on that. First of all, traditional mapping fails to consider the emotions effectively enough. Some people may say we do a little bit of that, but it's not the core focus. The difference here is it is the core focus for us, because what we see is what we emotionally react to, and that is what drives behavior. So it has to be that. The second point is we prioritize. Um, we Well, the second point actually is we have a framework for looking at emotions. Remember that... Uh, four-stage framework. If you don't have a framework for looking at emotions, when you do it, it can be less than half-baked. Thirdly, we have a means of quantifying. We're not just going to give you hundreds of opportunities and touch points. We're saying through that quantification method, what is the key ones you should focus on. And finally, the key, and often missed one, is creation. How can we use the creative equity within your organization, not just the analytical equity, to derive a 2B experience that works, you can see what will happen, helps the cheapest form of pilot, and is easy to communicate. Storyboarding is the way we do that. That is a difference. Um, the other kind of facet, facet to that is how do you typically measure coping and val valiance? At the main okay, point. Coping events. Well, this is where we would typically go through with our experts in terms who are trained, who've done numerous examples of what we actually call moment mapping, which is the same thing really as you would traditionally call journey mapping or touch point mapping. They walk the experience, they understand the valence, the happy unhappiness in an experience, the coping, the high coping, low pointing point in an experience. They're well versed in that, so it's that expert view that helps. Yes, in, in, in essence, obviously we didn't demonstrate all the tools and techniques that we use to um, get to the meaning of, um, or customer's perception of the experience. Um, the, um, the tools that we use are actually based uh, on some of the experience psychology principles. Um, they've been translated into, uh, you might say, semi-projective, some projective techniques, um, but if, if you would like um, a very simple way of doing it, um, even to be honest, a simple emotional barometer could help. I think that's something anyone can can apply. Um, our approach is a bit more sophisticated and complicated. It's science-based, but as a starters, um, if you want um, an approach that is systematic enough, you can just apply an emotional barometer. 
Okay. And one, one final question here, because we are over time. Um, but with regard to the storyboarding, I understand that it's really kind of helping to tease out more of the story. It's, it's not as linear, perhaps, as traditional methods. Can you talk a little bit more about the profiling and the benefit of the storyboarding piece in terms of how that helps draw out more information? Well, I mean, it's, it's again, it's a little bit going back to consumer, uh, more customer psychology. Um, if you're thinking linearly, you're thinking analytically. You want to move away from an analytical mindset to a creative mindset. You also want to think holistically. When we look at touch points and redesign, we don't just want to focus on the touch point. We want to think about, well, how does that change the, our customer story? Storyboarding is the way to do that because it has, is, is creative, it's artistic, it opens up the mind to more possibilities, and critically, it's practical. You have to write a story. You have to say what is going to happen, almost like a film script. You have to design and say and think about the practicalities of what you're talking about and also the visual practicalities. How does it look visually? Is it going to change the experience of you emotionally? It's, it, and you need to move, you need to make that creative leap away from thinking of the analytical detail to thinking of the whole. And remember customers, there's no better way, they typically communicate B2B as well as B2C in stories. If you think about uh, any uh, customer engagement, uh, you will be thinking about the story of when you went to this store and this, that, and the other happened. That's how people think, and you need to work that in your journey mapping, and you need an effective way, critically also, to communicate. And again, pictures and stories are the best way to culturally embed this in your organization and get bored by and I think it tends to help people unleash their imaginations in a little bit better way. Um, with that, I'd like to, to draw this webinar right. to a close. Um, thank you so much again, Stephen and Kalina, for presenting your thoughts. Uh, for those of you who have not set forward your questions, please do complete the survey because there's an opportunity for you to ask questions in the survey as well. And that survey means a lot to us. It helps us understand whether or not we met your expectations and, and what you, got, you gained from today's presentation. So with that, I wish you a wonderful day, and thanks again for investing your time with Beyond Philosophy today. Thank you.